This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum bringing you episode 51 of season 2 of the Westford Wardsman podcast. The Westford Wardsman uh, newspaper was part of Turner's Public Spirit, a weekly newspaper in air a century ago. In this episode, we'll be reading the Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, December 18th, 1909. I'll elaborate on what was happening in Westford in 1909. The first section is the Westford Center section. Mrs. Helen Layton's Westford friends much regretted to hear last week that she was detained from her teaching in Hollis with an attack of diphtheria. At Thanksgiving time, when a number of cases prevailed in our own town, Mrs. Layton refrained from joining the relatives here, not wishing to take any risks on her daughter Frances's account, and now to have taken it herself seems most unfortunate. Mr. and Mrs. Alonzo H. Sutherland and Mrs. Sebastian, uh, I'm sorry, Mrs. S.B. Wright have been attending the sessions of the State Grange at Springfield this week. The library's legacy of $1,000 by the will of the late John M. Osgood has been received by the town. The sum is slightly reduced by the inheritance tax. Earlier in the year, $150 was received in a similar way from the estate of Mrs. Jenny Reed Wilkins. The loyalty of these former residents and the substantial help to the library will be sincerely appreciated by the town. A very attractive collection of photographs of Yellowstone Park is to be at the library until December 23rd. The next section is titled Social and Sale. The Loyalty Club of the Congregational Church held a social and sale in the vestry last Thursday evening. This club is formed of girls in the Sunday school and was organized by Mrs. Houghton G. Osgood and Mrs. Marshall. Ill health has compelled Mrs. Osgood to give up her work with the class for the present, and Mrs. Lillian Lumbert has most capably taken her place, and under hers and Mrs. Marshall's direction, their first social was a more creditable success, a most creditable success. There were sales tables for fancy and useful articles, food and candy. Refreshments of cake and cocoa were served during the evening, and entertainment of song and duets was given by Adrith Carter, Elizabeth Kimball, Ethel Richardson, and Mabel Woodbury, after which Henry Van Dyke's beautiful story of, quote, the other wise man, end quote, was read by Miss Martha Taylor and illustrated with the stereopticon owned by the church. Arthur E. Day manipulated the slides. About $23 were realized as a fund for the treasury of the club. The presentation to the vestry of a piano chair, a much-needed article, is one of the uses planned for a part of this sum. Next section is called Banquet. For seven consecutive seasons, the social event in the Congregational Church calendar for December has been the annual church banquet. This was the church located at the corner of Lincoln Street and uh, Boston Road, now used for the Center for the Perfor- uh, Center for the Performing Arts, I guess it's called. This season's affair took place Tuesday evening of this week at the church and was carried out on the same general plan as its predecessor, although in no wise lacking in originality and interest for time rings, many changes, and the group's of people gathered at the long tables are never twice alike. Tuesday evening's gathering proved a real success with its good weather, large attendance, fine supper, and list of good speakers. People began to gather by half past six in the audience room and at seven promptly formed in line and marched to the vestry where an appetizing menu of chicken pie, mashed potato, squash, celery, rolls, coffee, Pies, sherbet, and fruit was spread. During the gathering of the guests, Mrs. Charles P. Marshall presided at the organ in her own skillful way. She was the wife of the uh, pastor of the church. The decorations were in the Christmas colors of red and green. There were long runners of red through the center of the tables with twigs of hemlock and at regular intervals, vases of brilliant poinsettias with greenery, wreaths, stars, and hemlock branches were also used to advantage 
uh, about the rooms. After the supper had been faithfully attended to with its accompaniment of merry sociability, the Toastmaster, John P. Wright, called to order, and with his inherent keen wit and gift of quick repartee that have enlivened previous gatherings, introduced old friends with fresh messages as well as a number of new speakers. The program was not too long, each speaker keeping within the allotted time, and the audience had not time to get tired, and many a hearty laugh should have proved an antidote for any indigestion. The good pastor of the church, Reverend Charles P. Marshall, came first with one of his inimitable Scotch readings entitled On the Craft. He was a, a native of Scotland and could speak with a thick Scottish brogue, apparently. The next speaker introduced was Reverend Alan C. Farron of the High Street Church, Lowell. With his pleasing personality, this speaker brought felicitous greetings balanced with a few earnest thoughts on the constructive and destructive side of the building of human character. The next speaker was also new to the audience, Miss Edith Lawrence of the Academy Teaching Force, who gave a graceful and charming sketch on toasts and toastmasters from the ancient times to the present. This enjoyable number closed with a most original and pleasing acrostic on the name of the toastmaster of the evening, contributed by Miss Elizabeth Cushing. Mrs. Ada L. Weber of Littleton, always a welcome guest at our gatherings, next gave a solo rendered with her full musical voice and expressiveness. Henry Smith, president of the Lowell Board of Trade, was then introduced, and in the time allotted gave a thoughtful presentation of some of our modern economic conditions. Miss Martha J. Taylor followed the subject of her toast being the farmer. This was given in Miss Taylor's happiest vein and was a discriminating treatment of many phases of the lives of the dwellers in our rural communities. Leonard W. w. Wheeler then responded to the toast, Opportunity, comma, a home. Logic and good sense characterized the treatment of the opportunities for livelihood and development of character. The speaker saw right in our midst. Music next interspersed the speakers when John S. Grieg gave a solo, and Principal Woodward of the Academy closed the program with some thoughts on school life, given with the insight of the experienced teacher. At the beginning of the ban banquet, Reverend Benjamin H. Bailey, uh, he was the pastor of the First Presbyterian Unitarian Church, invoked the divine blessing in his own impressive way, and at its close, the audience rose to their feet and sang with much heartiness a verse of old Lang Syne, after which social greetings and the gradual dispersing of the gathering. The committee in charge of the program was Mr. Marshall and Charles O. Prescott. Those in charge of the supper were um, Mademoiselles Taylor, Knight, Wheeler, Whitney, Hartford and Mrs. Atwood, Layton, and Burnham. Decorations, uh, Mrs. Grieg, Hartford, Merritt, and Woodward, and the Mrs. Taylor, Grant, Burnham, and Cushing, and Lawrence. The next section is the About Town section. At the, as the guests of W. W. Manning of Ayer, William R. Taylor attended the banquet of the Wachusett Tennis League held Thursday evening at the Sterling Inn in Sterling. He was uh, one of Samuel Taylor's two sons, and the Martha Taylor mentioned above was, all, one, was his one daughter, and both of the boys played tennis quite a bit. The fortnightly club is still a useful factor in the realm of the town nearest the North Pole. Uh, that is Northwestford. If its contributions to society prove only the widow's might, that's a reference to Mark 12:42. Even this is much better as a light, as a lighting influence than a lighted candle, quote under a bushel, end quote, which is referred to in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. For example, example Matthew 5:15. The next meeting will be held at the Wright Schoolhouse Friday evening, December 24th. The exercises will be largely of a Christmas nature. Study the mood for a good time and bring it with you. This is safer than trusting the others to bring it about. Mill pond skating at Brookside was the sport the rear day of last week. That, that 
which means it's Saturday or Sunday, and open water close by. The next thing liable on the program may be mill pond drowning. History for warning is a failure. Grassy Pond has 10 acres of skating water two feet deep. You can't drown here unless you go in head first and are anxious to stay there. The Honorable Herbert E. Fletcher and family are spending purely pleasurable days in New York City. They will return in season to brighten Christmas days with home and village life. While absent, Mr. and Mrs. Hill from Vermont, Mrs. Fletcher's father and mother, have been visiting at the Fletcher home on Oak Hill. Mr. Hill fell downstairs into the cellar, breaking his arm in two places. That's kind of... Kind of seemed like it's added as an afterthought. It, it should have been a forethought. John Adams Taylor is home from Miami University for the Voices of Christmas Time. He's the other brother. Plans are being matured for the Farmers Institute to be held in Westford in January. Our own native townsman and academy graduate, George Albert Drew, has consented to give the morning address on orcharding. Uh, he was an expert at that, of course. At present, he has charge of a large estate in Greenwich, Connecticut. Reverend Benjamin H. Bailey has been engaged as Toastmaster, which is evidence that there will be something stirring in wit, wisdom, and anecdote. And Mr. Troll, the Committee on Institutes, has engaged a reader of well-known ability to produce amusement. For afternoon, it is expected that Professor Ford of Amherst Agricultural College will give an address on corn, although the afternoon program is still uncertain in nature. While the date has not been fixed, it is hoped to have it as early as the second Wednesday, January 12th. Next is the Westford Academy section. The meeting of the trustees of the Westford Academy was held at Boston last Saturday. The members present included the Honorable John D. Long, uh, who was a uh, former principal of Westford Academy when he graduated from Harvard, later became uh, governor of Massachusetts, and later became secretary of the Navy. Uh, the members present included Honorable John D. Long, of Hingham, Reverend Edward A. Horton of Boston, Henry M. Wright of Quincy, J. Henry Fletcher of Belmont, J. Adams Bartlett of Chelmsford, Abile J. Abbott, George T. Day, Captain Sherman H. Fletcher, Walter C. Wright, and Charles O. Prescott of Westford. The treasurer's report was read and accepted, showing the funds of the corporation wisely administered. The following officers were elected. George T. Day, President, the Honorable Herbert E. Fletcher, Vice President, Captain Sherman H. Fletcher, Secretary, Abile J. Abbott, Treasurer, George T. Day, Auditor, John C. Abbott, Captain Sherman H. Fletcher, George T. Day, Standing Committee, Reverend E. A. Horton, Abile J. Abbott, and Julian A. Cameron, Committee on Teachers, Abile J. Abbott, J. Adams Bartlett, J. Henry Fletcher, and the Honorable Charles S. Hamlin, Committee on Loans and Finance. The Standing Committee, having engaged Mrs. George T. Day to prepare a catalog of former teachers and students up to the time of the centennial, reported that 2,500 names had been cataloged and ready for printing. This will prove exceptionally interesting reading for all lovers of history and especially for all who knew Westford Academy in its infancy and in its honorable and useful life. In it, it, in its preserved usefulness of our own day of added opportunities, thanking the compiler in advance would be safe manners, as a perusal of this history is likely to be proved interesting and absorbing. In fact, this is one of the a wonderful uh, history books of Westford. It was when it was published in. 1912, it was uh, entitled A General Catalog of Trustees, Teachers, and Students, Westford Academy, Westford Mass, 1792 to 1895. It was written and published by Cordelia Fletcher Day. It's uh, actually available at the museum office and at the J.V. Fletcher Library as a reference work. It has nice biographies of the tr teachers, trustees, and students of Westford Academy over that time period. The next section is Forge Village. 
Mrs. Courtney, mother of Mrs. George E. Mountain, while going for milk Friday morning, slipped on some ice on the railroad crossing and fell, breaking her wrist. Charles Flanagan, flagman for the Boston and Main crossing, witnessed the accident and assisted her to her home close by, where Dr. Warren H. Sherman set the broken bone. The accident is doubly painful to Mrs. Courtney on account of her age, which is 84 years. Christmas exercises were held in Cameron School on Friday afternoon, December 17th. The rooms were tastefully decorated in keeping with the season. The school will remain closed until December 27th. The annual, annual Christmas tree exercises will be held in Recreation Hall Monday evening, December 19th for the Sunday school children of St. Andrew's Mission. A varied program has been arranged and Santa Claus has already sent word that he will arrive promptly at 7.30. A cordial reception awaits him. Reverend Thomas L. Fisher will celebrate the 25th anniversary of his ordination in St. Luke's Church, Malden, Sunday, December 19th. Reverend Mr. Fisher began his ministry there and has built the church. Reverend Thomas J. Crosby will conduct the evening service at St. Andrew's Mission by exchange. Reverend Fisher was currently, or currently in 1909, a pastor of St. Andrew's Episcopal Church of Ayer, which was the sponsor of St. Andrew's Mission in Forge Village, and he was thus well known to the people of Forge Village. The next section is called Death. Henry Catchpole, with his son, John W., and daughter, Miss Emily, attended the funeral Monday at Worcester of Westall C. Kirk. He spells his first name W-E-S-T-E-L-L. The fireman who was killed Friday by being caught under a wall. Westall C. Kirk was the youngest of eight children of Mr. and Mrs. William Kirk, former residents of Westford, who were one of the earliest English families to settle here. Besides his aged parents, he leaves a wife and five small children, the youngest seven weeks old, four brothers, one of whom is driver for the fire wagon in Worcester, one a special police officer of Leminster, and three sisters. Deceased was 34 years old and appointed a permanent fireman a short time ago. Mrs. William Kirk, mother of deceased, is a sister of Henry Catchpole, and this is the first death to occur in that large family. Actually, Henry Catchpole's wife, Fanny, Fanny B. Catchpole, died March 11, 1908 in Westford. The next section is Graniteville. The members of the Holy Name Society of St. Catherine's Church held a very interesting meeting on last Sunday after the 945 o'clock mass and elected the following officers for the year 1910. John F. Cavanaugh, President, J. A. Healy, Treasurer, James O'Brien, Financial Secretary, and A. R. Wall, Corresponding Secretary. Excellent skating has been enjoyed here during the early part of the week, and in Saturday, on Saturday and on Sunday, large crowds assembled on the mill pond to, enjo to indulge in this popular sport. The rain and snow, snow spoiled the fun, however, and at the present writing, the ice is in poor condition. A daughter named Mary A. was born to Mr. and Mrs. Alfred Prynne of this village on Thursday, December 9th. Owing to the present rush of business, the C.G. Sergeant Sons Corporation is now using the large building on Bridge Street, formerly used as a blacksmith and wheelwright shop to erect a part of their machinery. And in fact, they used that building on, Rivers, on Bridge Street for quite some time. Walter M. Phelps of Fort Warren has been visiting at the home of Mr. and Mrs. William J. Robinson in this village for the past few days. Mr. Phelps has served three years in the U.S. Infantry, having been stationed at Plattsburgh, New York, and Des Moines, Iowa. He was discharged in 1906 with the rank of corporal. He re-enlisted, this time with the U.S. Cavalry, for three years and was stationed at Fort Ethan Allen, Vermont. He was honorably discharged in October 1909 with the rank of sergeant. He is at present awaiting orders for a commission in the Coast Artillery Corps at Fort Warren. This, this state, uh, which is Fort Warren, is located on George's Island at the entrance to Boston Harbor and was constructed from 1833 to 1861, being finished just before the Civil War started. 
Mr. Phelps, who is a cousin of Mrs. Robinson, is very much interested in Army life and thinks the life of a soldier is the only thing for a young man. The Sunday school children, both in the Methodist Episcopal Church and St. Catharines of this village, are now busy rehearsing for the Christmas tree exercises. Judging from the present plans, it is thought that the exercises in both churches will be held on different nights, and this will enable all those that wish to attend both events. The members of St. Catherine's Temperance Society held a largely attended meeting in their rooms on Wednesday night. Con considerable business of importance was transacted and the following officers elected for the ensuing six months. Thomas Hughes, President, A.R. Wall, Vice President, R.J. Heeman, Financial Secretary, W.A. Wall, Recording Secretary, Henry Riney, Henry LeDuc, Omer LeDuc, Trustees, Raymond Charlton, Doorkeeper. The children of the first and second primary grades of the sergeant school held, the, held their Christmas tree exercises on Friday afternoon. This affair was in charge of the two teachers, Miss Mary A. Dunn and Miss Frances Bannister. The program will be given later. Beginning next week, all the schools in this village will close for the annual two weeks Christmas vacation. The schools will open again at the usual hour on Monday, January 3rd. That's the news in Westford for the week ending December 18th, 1909. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Ryan Cousins of Westford Cat for providing technical support. You can find transcriptions and podcasts from the Wardsman at our Westford uh, at our West website at museum.westford.org or visit the Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. This is Bob Oliphant, and I hope you will join us for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you. <laughs>